One of them was my desire to express myself all the time, and I, it still drives me to this day, just to define myself and express myself and, and watch my own evolution as though I'm outside of myself watching it. Um, I think I was, you know, there were times when I was younger where I felt really invisible, so I think I was driven by thinking that if I shared certain things, I would finally be heard in a way that I felt I hadn't been when I was younger. And um, I had just a deep desire to entertain, too. I loved, I loved being on stage and dancing and expressing in that way. I loved collaborating. And music, I adore. It's one of my favorite forms of expression. And What's the first record you remember buying? When I was really little, I brought, bought the Smurfs record. <laughs> It's funny you mention that. I do hear the influence, uh, especially on supposed infatu former infatuation junkie. There's a lot of Smurf. You can hear the Smurfette elements. Exactly. Well, there was a Smurf remix, wasn't there? Thank you. I, think. Um, I tried to get Smurf to uh, remix it. There must have been an upside to being a teen queen. What did you learn positively that sort of helps you as a musician, even on Under Rug Swept? Um, I learned arrangement and structure and I learned um, things that I apply now when I'm producing in the studio. Um, I really feel like I developed my voice during that time and tiptoed into the, the into the realm of writing autobiographically. It was sort of little, you know, baby steps toward that. And I think had I not gone through, you know, those seven years or six years of, of having the experiences that I had in Canada, I would certainly not be who I am today and writing in the way that I'm writing today because it was a natural progression and an evolution that every link in the chain is just as important as, as the ones that come later to me. So it's a pretty wild experience. It's a lot of sweating and dancing and traveling and baptism by fires left, right, and center. Take me back to when you were on the plane coming to Los Angeles, you know, to work and to find, uh, you know, mm. collaborators. What was your mission? What was going through your mind when you got on that plane to LA? Um, I didn't feel anything other than really inspired and very passionately, ruthlessly um, ready to create the environment in which I could just be as honest and as unstructured as, as I possibly could be. The, the environments that I had been in before, there was, it was, there was sort of uh, the structure of a song was something that was vehemently sort of adhered to and, and stuck to. And, and while I think there's a place for structure and I'm happy for it in some of my songs, there are also parts of me that just want to throw all of that out and not really worry about some predetermined way that a song is supposed to come out and sound and sonically or musically or lyrically, anything. So, um, so when I was coming to Los Angeles, I just remember really being excited about getting away from what I had begun to equate as, as, a, as a ceiling of sorts. And of course my spirit, as I think almost everyone's spirit, uh, is really um, excited about the concept of freedom and limitlessness. So that's how I felt when I was coming to Los Angeles. Is there a downside to that kind of freedom? Can you have too much freedom in terms of, is there anything you've ever written that you regret in terms of its impact on someone? Because you do write from your life and from your experience and that involves other people. Have you ever regretted a line? And then you can share that line if you, if you want to compound the, uh, the mistake you made. Um, no regrets ever about anything I've ever done. Um, and uh, I don't believe that there's such thing as too much freedom ever. So, um, but there, I do believe that there's a distinct difference between secrecy and privacy. And my goal is to not be secretive in the slightest, but I definitely have a sense of respect for other people's privacy. And in that sense, I don't disclose who the songs are about. If the, if the person themselves want to do it, that's fine. And, but I do have respect for other people's boundaries and, and, uh, and privacy. But at the same time, if it was something that was something that I experienced, then you know, it, is, it is my form of expression. It is me saying my story, so, or my take on it anyway. Have you ever changed a, a, a name to protect the innocent or the guilty? <laughs> um, yes, I have. I've used nicknames and middle names, and, but it was a name that still applied to the person for me. The, the fine line that I had to get to was I couldn't just use a fake name because then I wouldn't be able to sing it with any sort of conviction. So I had to have some sort of connection with that person. Your, how many of your songs are traditional sort of verse, chorus? It seems like... Not too many of them are traditional. You, you know, many of them have their own logic. 
Yeah, they kind of tell me what they want, the songs. You know, if the story has not been told in the way that it needs to be told by the second verse, then I'll just write a whole other section and certain choruses repeat lyrically and other choruses, there's never repetition throughout the whole song. And it really is about whether everything's been said. And once it's been said, the song's finished. So. Tell me, uh, who is Glenn Ballard and what's his significance in your career? I had lived in Toronto for um, close to two years and written with several people. And um, I, had, I had sort of departed the environment that I had been in when I was a teenager and wanted to sort of create or realize or discover, whatever the word is, I don't know the perfect word, but my own voice and my own style and my own you know, my own way of expressing myself in songs and, and I knew that it would take a little bit of time to kind of get my bearings in that sense creatively and musically and otherwise. And um, I knew that I wanted it to be in a, a collaborative experience at that period of time in 1994, but I wanted to make sure that it was with someone with whom I felt safe and nurtured and seen and, and I wasn't going to stop until I met that person or found myself in that environment. So I met him and I walked in and his environment was really, felt really safe for my artist. And, uh, and that's when we started writing. We started writing 20 minutes after we met. We wrote a song called The Bottom Line. And, and, and then we just started writing songs that eventually wound up being on Jagged Little Pill in a really short amount of time. And do you remember even the chorus? Can you give us 10 seconds of The Bottom Line? OK, let's see if I can remember that one. It's uh, Go meet you down at the bottom line and open your heart with my hands. And you'll hear the sound of pretenses falling and something, something. But we, but we took that lyric and we wound up using it in a song called All I Really Want Later. So it was kind of, it was kind of this, I don't know, forward to a book. Your process with Glenn recording was pretty unique and it's contrary to sort of everyone's sort of the naysayers in your career, and there have been one or two, yeah. uh, uh, you know, sort of acted like it was some contrived, overproduced thing, when mm. my understanding of how you actually worked is it's quite the opposite. Can you take us through, I'll take, give you one of my very favorite things you've ever done, mm. uh, Hand in My Pocket. Mm. Um, tell me how that would have gotten written and recorded. If you can just take me through the entire process. Yeah, that one I remember specifically. I was, we were, you know, jamming and coming up with different ideas for different things and nothing was really resonating. So we just stopped and he left the room and, and I just started writing, just self-defining journal things. And what I was writing became the lyrics for Hand in My Pocket. And he came in and I said, I have an idea. And then, then musically we wrote it together and it took about eight minutes. And then we recorded it within a half an hour. And that was the demo version that is on the record. And we had done other versions to try and sort of flesh it out. And you know, and at the end of the day, I just kept saying, the demo to me is, is it. That's it. Let's not, let's not go elsewhere for this. And, and ultimately, that was the one that we wound up using on the record. So. And can you uh, share a little of that song with us in any way that's comfortable for you? If you're either singing right here, you can go down there if you feel like it. I just feel the need emotionally, <laughs> my masculinity and my femininity, to, to the hear it. yes, yes, yes. Um, what are these? Are these lyrics here? I'll just read them. Okay. Um, this is the whole duality thing. So I was literally just sitting there. This is in 1994. I'm broke, but I'm happy. I'm poor, but I'm kind. I'm short, but I'm healthy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm high, but I'm grounded. I'm sane, but I'm overwhelmed. And I'm lost, but I'm hopeful, baby. And what it all comes down to is that everything's going to be fine, fine, fine. I've got one hand in my pocket, and the other one is giving a high five. This is such a, this brings me back so much to that, to that time period. It was like just really embracing both sides. This is an amazing woman named Debbie Ford who wrote a book called The Dark Side of the Light Chasers. And, I think of this song when I when I read it because she basically says all our parts, our humble parts and our and our arrogant parts and our fearful parts and our joyful parts and our you know our angry parts and our soft parts, just like embracing all of it. And I feel like in this song I was kind of edging toward that concept. So, are you a more or less hopeful person than you were when you wrote that? Um, 
I don't believe in hope anymore. I believe in belief. I believe in knowing. Um, so, it, it, and that's in a positive sense in that it almost goes beyond hoping because hoping implies that it might not happen and knowing that it will applies in, in, in the sense that I can only take responsibility for my own self. Knowing is that I know I will be positive. I know that I will um, come to the table or communicate or whatever it is that it is that I at one point hoped for. Now I just, I look, I look to know it as opposed to hope for it because hope there's always a question mark. To listen to that. Everything we've heard about you suggests that your trip to India after uh, Jagged Little Pill mm. was a very important journey for you. Uh, how did you come to take that journey? Who came with you on that journey and, and what happened? Um, it was after Jagged Little Pill and I was doing several different things, delving into some charities and um, really wanting to give back because just by default being in the public eye and you've been around it a lot so I'm sure you know this. Um, more than most, it's, it's just an incredibly narcissistic experience. Like everything starts turning at the point. It just started being about me all the time and I was really getting sick of my own image and my own voice and my own self and I wanted to just step outside of it all. And um, So my brother had been over in India for close to a year and he said, come over, just come visit me. And I was like, oh my God, I really wanted to go. And I, it was around Christmas time, so my Christmas gift to my two aunts and my mom and two of my dear girlfriends uh, was to bring them with me to India. So we all went together and we went to Calcutta and, and did some, some work at uh, Mother Teresa's place um, for a little bit of time and then traveled all over the place, did some yoga. It was pretty amazing. Tell me a little bit about uh, that I would be good. Um, where were you when you wrote that and who were you when you wrote that? Um, I was feeling an immense amount of pressure after Jagged Little Pill. Um, to write the follow-up. There's so much pressure for me to not only write it right away, but but to have it be something that was going to be, you know, juxtaposed right next to Jaggy Little Pill and compared to it in a way that I ultimately wish art could be in it, its own little vacuum, you know, but relativity is something that exists, so I couldn't get around it. Um, and I went to India and I just sort of dropped off the face of the earth and had my own conceptual death in so many ways, spiritually and otherwise. And um, I came back and started writing songs for supposed former infatuation junkie and I was inspired and horrified because I wasn't really sure I wanted to do it. And, um, and uh, I was at the studio one day with Glenn and I just turned to him and said, I don't want to be here and I'm not ready to be here. And he said, okay, come back when you're ready. And I didn't know whether I'd be coming back in two days or two years. So I went home and I had friends at my house and I wanted to just have some solitude. So I locked myself in my closet and I just lit a candle and I just sat there and I just started crying and, uh, and just wrote those lyrics that wound up being in that I would be good. And it came out in about, you know, three and a half minutes, it was done. Well, now that we've talked about it, would you mind playing it for us? I'd love to. Great. Yeah, you ready? Do we wait for last year to get out of I don't think so. <laughs> Even if I went bang 
There's a fine line between, uh, you know, respecting someone's privacy and being secretive. And I think secretive experiences in my own life have been really negative for me. So I was ready to share this information. And in doing so, it required me to share that same information that is the subject matter of Hands Clean with other people who also didn't know about it. So my songs in my own life have a way of pushing me to do something that had I not written the song, I probably would get away with continuing to be cowardly about it. So. Does it bother you that the world is listening and trying to decipher these uh, hieroglyphics of uh, your love life? Yeah, I, I've been through it with you ought to know, though, so I, I, I'm not afraid of it. I wonder if uh, we've <coughs> talked about the song, if you would uh, sort of uh, end our evening by playing it for everybody. I'd love to. Thank you very much.
touch that weight and you keep your firm body and